We hope you enjoy the following video presentation sponsored by the C.S. Lewis Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization with a mission to equip and encourage Christians to live their faith within the world of ideas and arts. To help us continue to host events and make videos like this one, please make a donation after viewing the video by going to www.cslewis.org or clicking the link below. Thank you. I know most of the leading lights in the world of C.S. Lewis scholarship, and I know no one with Michael's depth, breadth, and wisdom and wit. It's a great pleasure for me to invite you to welcome Dr. Michael Ward as he addresses the topic of ethical considerations in Narnia. Thank you, Andrew. I've never stood so high above a congregation before. Golly, got a bit of vertigo. <laughs> and I think I can't really give an address from this pulpit, which is really a place for giving a sermon, uh, without asking you to join me in prayer first. Come, Holy Ghost, our hearts inspire, and kindle with celestial fire. Thou the anointing spirit art, who dost thy sevenfold gifts impart. Amen. <clears throat> Ethical considerations in Narnia. We'll get to Narnia later on in this talk, but first some thoughts about Lewis and ethics more generally. Ethics, virtues, morality, goodness, sincerity, the secret of success is sincerity. If you can fake that, you've got it made. <laughs> now, I thought of that line recently. I think it comes from George Burns when I was reading the Screwtape Letters and Letter 14, which begins, My dear Wormwood, the most alarming thing in your last account of the patient is that he is making none of those confident resolutions which marked his original conversion. No more lavish promises of perpetual virtue, I gather. Not even the expectation of an endowment of grace for life, but only a hope for the daily and hourly pittance to meet the daily and hourly temptation. This is very bad. I see only one thing to do at the moment. Your patient has become humble. Have you drawn his attention to this fact? All the virtues are less formidable to us once the man is aware that he has them. But this is specially true of humility. Catch him at the moment when he is really poor in spirit and smuggle into his mind the gratifying reflection, by Jove, I'm being humble. And almost immediately, pride, pride at his own humility, will appear. If he awakes to the danger and tries to smother this new form of pride, make him proud of his attempt. And so on through as many stages as you please. But don't try this too long, for fear you awake his sense of humor and proportion, in which case he will merely laugh at you and go to bed. Being proud of one's humility, faking one's sincerity. Lord, give me chastity, but not yet. George Burns, C.S. Lewis, St. Augustine, they all knew that trying to be virtuous is a very funny thing. Trying to be morally upright is almost as funny as trying to walk upright. And we know that trying to walk upright is funny because of all those videos we've enjoyed of people falling over. We love the banana skin joke. We love seeing people on the skating rink. There's nothing funnier than a good pratfall. Look, he's fallen over, and he's fallen over again. I'm not so thunk as you drink I am. <laughs> the drunk man pretending to be sober the Lothario asserting his purity. I did not have sex with that woman. <laughs> the pot smoker asserting his temperance. 
I did not inhale. <laughs> the Republican giving thanks he's not a Democrat. The fallen man attempting to be homo erectus. It's one of the great incongruities in this universe. Let him who stands take heed lest he fall. And I'm just waiting for the bottom of this pulpit to fall out. By Jove, I'm being humble. How to get out of this double bind? Laughter helps, certainly. So does sleep. He'll laugh at you and go to bed. So does practical common sense. The more we insist on thinking about our humility, am I humble enough? Have I really put to death my pride? The more we inhibit the actual growth of humility. So it's best just to change the subject. Like the gardener who keeps digging up his spring bulbs to see whether they've sprouted, he'd do much better just to turn his back on them. Lewis homes in on this in a letter to Edward Lofstrom in 1962. He says, the continual voice which tells you that your best actions are secretly filled with subtle self-regard and your best prayers still wholly egocentric must for the most part be simply disregarded as one disregards the impulse to keep on looking under the bandage to see whether the cut is healing. If you're always fidgeting with the bandage, it never will. A text you should keep in mind, Lewis says, is 1 John 3.20. If our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. I sometimes pray, Lord, give me no more and no less self-knowledge than I can at this moment make a good use of. Remember, he is the artist and you are only the picture. You can't see it. So quietly submit to be painted. That is, keep on fulfilling all the obvious duties of your station, asking forgiveness for each failure, and then leaving it alone. You are in the right way. Walk. Don't keep on looking at it. Thus Lewis to Edward Lofstrom. So a certain kind of willed ignorance is one way of dealing with this bind that we're in. We have to stop fussing and get on. If we wait until our, no, if we wait until our motives are perfect in order to act, we'll never do anything at all. Unless there's some way on the boat, the rudder won't steer. You can't rotate the Queen Mary while she's at dock. But it's not just that we have to stop fussing. We have to stop thinking about fussing. <laughs> are my bulbs sprouting is almost as bad as digging them up to see whether they are. Is my wound healing? Don't even think about it. Lewis quotes George MacDonald, the door into life generally opens behind us. And let me give you six, seven quick quotes from Lewis himself, which show how recurrent this idea is in his own writings. From that hideous strength, Mark Studdock was not thinking in moral terms at all, or else, what is much the same thing, he was having his first deeply moral experience. English literature in the 16th century, the ethical category is self-destructive, Morality is healthy only when it's trying to abolish itself. Thirdly, the four loves. The real work must be, of all our works, the most secret. Even as far as possible secret from ourselves, our right hand must not know what our left is doing. Fourthly, surprised by joy. The moment good taste knows itself, some of its goodness is lost. Five, Lewis's essay on Walter Scott. Eros fled when Psyche turned the lamp upon him. And of course, we have a whole novel on the same theme, Until We Have Faces. Sixthly, his letter to Edith Gates. It is the self you really are and not its reflection in consciousness that matters most. And seventhly, Lewis's essay on the authorized version of the Bible. An influence which can't escape our consciousness won't go very deep. 
consciousness. It may be worth spending a little bit more time examining precisely what Lewis meant by consciousness. We know that Lewis divided consciousness into two modes, enjoyment and contemplation. This was a distinction he first encountered in the work of the philosopher Samuel Alexander, and which was important enough for him to record in his diary. I took Alexander's space, time, and deity out of the Union Library, he says, and went to Wadham College, where I sat and walked in the garden, reading the introduction, enjoying the beauty of the place, and greatly interested by my author's truthful antithesis of enjoyment and contemplation. And he was later to describe this antithesis as an indispensable tool of thought. And indeed, he thought it so useful, he eventually wrote his own essay on the subject, Meditation in a Tool Shed, you may know it, in which he recasts contemplation and enjoyment as follows. I was standing today in the dark tool shed. The sun was shining outside, and through a crack at the top of the door, there came a sunbeam. From where I stood, that beam of light with the specks of dust floating in it was the most striking thing in the place. Everything else was almost pitch black. I was seeing the beam, not seeing things by it. Then I moved so that the beam fell on my eyes. Instantly, the whole previous picture vanished. I saw no tool shed and, above all, no beam. Instead, I saw, framed in the irregular cranny at the top of the door, green leaves moving on the branches of a tree outside and beyond that, 90-odd million miles away, the sun. Looking along the beam and looking at the beam are very different experiences. Looking along the beam, of course, is what Alexander had called enjoyment, inhabited knowledge, personal, committed knowledge. And looking at the beam is what Alexander had called contemplation, abstract, external, impersonal knowledge. For Lewis, all our conscious life is conducted in one or other of these two modes, and we can't do them both at the same time. The distinction is like the distinction in many languages between the two verbs for knowing, connaître and savoir in French, connaisseur and saber in Spanish. Lewis says we should be like the ancient Persians who debated everything twice, once when they were sober and once when they were drunk. We should try out every question in both lights, insofar as that's possible, and not have a prejudice in favor of one mode over the other. Sometimes we'll find reason to prefer one mode over the other in a given case, but we can't know that in advance. With regard to virtue, Lewis seems to be suggesting that the better mode is enjoyment rather than contemplation. As soon as we step back from our virtue and begin reflecting on it, some of its goodness is lost. But how far should we take this objection? Is Lewis saying that we should never think about virtue, that we mustn't contemplate ethical questions, but only enjoy ethical actions? What would Lewis make of this very conference of hundreds of people crossing the Atlantic and coming here to think about his ideas on virtue? Well, it's not an absolute either or, it's a matter of priorities. It's certainly not pointless to think about the virtues, to look at them from the outside, to contemplate them. After all, Lewis himself wrote many words about the cardinal and theological virtues in mere Christianity, and about the virtue of ordinacy in the four loves, about the philosophical basis for morality in the abolition of man. He was clearly not averse to thinking about moral questions, reflecting upon the nature of virtue. But he was insistent that that kind of activity is a secondary activity and has some possible negative implications. But only some. Let's look again at a few of the quotations I just read to you. In English literature in the 16th century, where he says the ethical category is self-destructive, and morality is healthy only when it's trying to abolish itself. He's not saying that morality must actually abolish itself now, or even that in this life it can abolish itself. Only that in principle, 
It should be trying to abolish itself, just as doctors try, in principle, to render their own medical profession unnecessary. In heaven, we won't need to reflect on ethical questions, but for now, we do. The Four Loves quote, the real work must be of all our works the most secret, even as far as possible, secret from ourselves. As far as possible, that's the key phrase. It may not be actually fully possible to keep our right hand from knowing what our left hand is doing, but we might at least try. The surprised by joy quote, the moment good taste knows itself, some of its goodness is lost. Some of its goodness, not necessarily all of its goodness. And his essay on the authorized version, an influence which can't escape our contemplative consciousness won't go very deep will not go very deep. It may go deep, but not to the uttermost depths. It's relatively shallow. So just because contemplation of virtue is less deep than enjoyment of virtue, well, that's no reason to abandon contemplation altogether. We should contemplate from time to time. We've been blessed with reflective minds. We should think about virtues as well as practice them. But the two activities are ranked, they're not equal. Obviously, practicing virtues, looking along the beam of virtuous activity is much more important than just thinking about them. As Lewis puts it with his customary wit in The Abolition of Man, I had sooner play cards against a man who was quite skeptical about ethics, but bred to believe that a gentleman does not cheat than against an irreproachable moral philosopher who had been brought up among sharpers. So moral philosophy is a legitimate and important exercise, but less important, all things considered, than actually behaving morally. Thinking about ethics is like thinking about grammar. The more you're thinking about grammar, the more likely it is that you're speaking a foreign language. In your native tongue, you will have so assimilated the rules of grammar that you no longer have to think about them. They've become part of you. And the most valuable thing about a sentence is not its grammar, but its style, its elegance, its balance. At the highest level, it's poetry. The great dancer won't be thinking about choreography. I must remember to take five steps to the right, then five steps to the left, and hold my arm just so no, the great dancer will have so internalized the choreography that she will bring it to life. And we will observe not a series of mechanical actions, but graceful movement, poetry in motion. She'll have got inside the dance. Lewis puts it this way in his little essay, Man or Rabbit. Mere morality is not the end of life. You were made for something quite different from that. Morality is indispensable, but the divine life, which gives itself to us and which calls us to be gods, intends for us something in which morality will be swallowed up. We are to be remade. All the rabbit in us is to disappear, the worried, conscientious, ethical rabbit, as well as the cowardly and sensual rabbit. It's a point he returns to in Mere Christianity, where he says, I think all Christians would agree with me if I said that though Christianity seems at first to be all about morality, all about duties and rules and guilt and virtue, yet it leads you on, out of all that, into something beyond. One has a glimpse of a country where they do not talk of those things, except perhaps as a joke. Everyone there is filled full with what we should call goodness, as a mirror is filled with light. But they do not call it goodness. They do not call it anything. They are not thinking of it. They are too busy looking at the source from which it comes. This line of thought is summed up with almost epigrammatic concision in the problem of pain, where Lewis reminds us that the road to the promised land leads past Mount Sinai. The road to the promised land leads past Mount Sinai. 
You must go to Mount Sinai and get your Ten Commandments. There's no escape from Egypt by another route. But you don't stop there. You go on into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, the land of purity and sweetness, the land of the reality to which those commandments pointed. Now, Narnia is rather like the promised land, I sometimes think. It's not perfection, it's not heaven, at least not until the end of the last battle, but it's nonetheless a place where real beatitude can be experienced, the happy land of Narnia, as it's called in The Horse and His Boy. Bree, the horse, you remember, exclaims while he's still exiled in the hot, sandy, southern, pagan kingdom of Calamon, and he's longing for Narnia and the north, he exclaims, the happy land of Narnia, Narnia of the heathery mountains and the thymy downs, Narnia of the many rivers, the plashing glens, the mossy caverns, and the deep forests ringing with the hammers of the dwarfs. Oh, the sweet air of Narnia. An hour's life there is better than a thousand years in Calamon. We can hear an echo of the psalmist there. Psalm 84, one day in thy courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. But it's not the allusion to the psalmist that I want to bring out of that short passage from the horse and his boy, so much as Bree's reference to the sweet air of Narnia. This is a very important phrase. The air of Narnia is a cru crucial consideration if we're to get at the roots of Lewis's fictional presentation of virtue. And how virtue in Narnia isn't talked about very much, but rather breathed in. I did inhale. <laughs> Naturally acquired virtue by a process of osmosis. To understand properly what Lewis means by that tiny word, air, we need to turn to his academic writings, where he discusses the medieval view of the cosmos and the idea that our Earth was surrounded by seven heavens, each heaven with its own planet and each planet with its own influences that it would shed upon the Earth, affecting people and events and even the metals in Earth's crust. Lewis comments in the discarded image that the planetary influences don't work upon us directly, but by first modifying the air of Earth's atmosphere. Beneath the orbit of the moon, according to medieval thought, was the realm of air. Above the orbit of the moon was the realm of ether. The planetary influences strike down from the ethereal realm into the realm of our air, and there they begin to take their effect. If you were ill in medieval times and your doctor couldn't explain the precise cause of your condition, he would attribute it to this influence which is at present in the air. And if you were an Italian doctor, Lewis says, he would doubtless say, questa influenza. Influenza, the medical profession has retained this useful word ever since. When you go down with flu next time, you are referring back to this old belief in the air of Earth's atmosphere that could be modified by planetary influences. And it's not just in his academic works where Lewis talks about this air. We see it in several places in his poetry too. In The Small Man Orders His Wedding, for example, Lewis writes the seemingly innocent phrase, the air burns as with incense. He means more by it than at first might appear. The air is heavy with incense, not because a literal thurible is burning, but because the dynasts seven incline from heaven, the seven planets are shedding their influences upon this wedding couple. And it's very interesting that these influences are sometimes described by Lewis as virtues. The hard virtue of Mars, for instance, in his poem, The Adam at Night. 
In another poem, the queen of drum, the queen of the title is fiddled all through with virtue of the moon. According to medieval thinking, we just breathe in these planetary influences without noticing it. We can't avoid them. In The Adam at Night, Lewis goes on to picture Adam sleeping and gently inhaling the planetary virtues, thrusting down far under his rock crust, finger-like rays from the heavens that probed, bringing to bloom the gold and diamond in his dark womb. The seething central fires moved with his breathing. Now, we can see very easily how this process of inhaling planetary virtues is analogous to the biblical picture of receiving the Holy Spirit. Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit, John 20. The Spirit is more like breath than it is like anything else we know. The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life, says Job. We know that the Hebrew word for spirit, ruach, means breath or wind. And so in John's Gospel, Jesus will tell us, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And think of the day of Pentecost. Acts 2, suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Air, wind, spirit. Now, just as Lewis is wary of our uh, thinking too much about virtue, so he was cautious when it came to thinking about the Holy Spirit. He was suspicious of anyone who claimed to be able to make the Holy Spirit an object of our conscious contemplation. He suspected that, and here's a quote from his sermon, Transposition. He suspected that, save by God's direct miracle, spiritual experience can never abide introspection. If even our emotions will not do so, much less will the operations of the Holy Ghost. The attempt to discover by introspective analysis our own spiritual condition is to me a horrible thing which reveals at best not the secrets of God's spirit and ours, but their transpositions in intellect, emotion, and imagination, and which at worst may be the quickest road to presumption or despair. The impossibility of inspecting our life in the spirit arises from the simple fact that we're enjoying it. We can't step outside it for, as Lewis says in Mere Christianity, he is inside you as well as outside. He is above me and within me and below me and all about me. He is always both within us and over against us. Letters to Malcolm. There is this inescapably participatory aspect to the Christian's relationship with God. And looking along the beam of that participation means inevitably that the beam is invisible. Lewis applied Alexander's category of enjoyment to our knowledge of the Holy Spirit. In mere Christianity, he says, in the Christian life, you are not usually looking at him, the Holy Spirit. You have to think of the third person of the Trinity as something inside you or behind you. And it's for this reason that Lewis isn't terribly concerned with sensible consolation, with intense, discreet sensations of the Holy Spirit's presence in his life. Because properly understood, the Holy Spirit is just as present when unsensed as when he is sensed. And in Lewis's view, the Spirit's insensible presence is the much more usual experience for the Christian. 
He says in a letter of 1952, the gift of the Holy Spirit can't usually be, perhaps not ever be, experienced as a sensation or emotion. In a letter of 1955, he writes that it is the actual presence, not the sensation of the presence of the Holy Ghost, which begets Christ in us. The sense of the presence is a super added gift for which we give thanks when it comes, and that's all about it. Now think of that moment at the start of the silver chair when Aslan blows Jill down into Narnia. We read that because Jill was moving at the same pace as the breath, there was no wind. I don't know if you've ever been ballooning. I've done it once. My two brothers and I took a, hot, a trip in a hot air balloon with our father to celebrate his 60th birthday. And I was amazed at how peaceful it was up there. We were moving through the sky very quickly, but we didn't feel the wind. And then I remembered that bit from the silver chair. We didn't feel the wind because we were moving in the wind. Like Jill in Aslan's breath, I was moving at the same rate as the wind and therefore couldn't feel it. Now, Jill's unawareness of being in the breath of Aslan is an unawareness that Lewis draws our attention to. But we as readers of Narnia should be aware of the unawareness of the characters to the effects of their air upon them, even when Lewis doesn't highlight it. Air means something special in Narnia. Lewis means something special when in The, in the Magician's Nephew he tells us that the young heir of Narnia is having a beneficial effect upon Uncle Andrew. You remember? Anyone could see that the heir of that young world was really doing the old gentleman good. In London he had been far too old to run. Now he ran at a speed which would have made him certain to win the hundred yards race at any prep school in England. Likewise in Prince Caspian. We're told the heir of Narnia works on Edmund so that all his old battles came back to him. And when the children discover the hidden armory in the ruins of Care Paravel, why has the string of Susan's bow not perished after all these centuries? Lewis suggests that it may have been some magic in the air. And yet again, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, we're told that once the ransacking of the witch's fortress was ended, her whole castle stood empty, with every door and window open, and the light and the sweet spring air flooding into all the dark and evil places which needed them so badly. Now, with Uncle Andrew, we might think that Lewis is just giving us a particularly striking example of someone taking the air like you would if you went for a day at the coast, to take the sea air. And in the case of the witch's castle, we might think that Lewis is just pointing out how an enclosed and stuffy place feels fresher once you've opened the windows. We might think it's all just natural, an ordinary use of the word air, but we would be wrong. The reference to the magic in the air in Prince Caspian tips us off. There's more going on here. Lewis is using the word air, I think, in three senses at once. The natural sense, yes, fair enough. You can take it perfectly literally. But then there's the planetary sense, because the planets influence us first by affecting the air of Earth's atmosphere. And then thirdly, in the pneumatological sense, the sense pertaining to the Holy Spirit, but the important point is, I think, that Lewis collapses the second and third meanings together. The planetary sense is turned to pneumatological effect. The stars and the planetary influences become symbols of the Holy Spirit. 
because in each Narnia chronicle, Lewis is taking one of the seven heavens from medieval cosmology and using it to control the way he portrays Aslan, using it to control the way he portrays the children's interactions with Aslan, using it to control the way he portrays the ornamental and incidental details in the story as well. The air is young in The Magician's Nephew, I believe, because this is a story written under the influence of Venus, so to speak, the planet of creativity. Aslan, who creates Narnia in this story, is portrayed in terms that Lewis elsewhere uses when writing about Venus. Aslan is not only creative, but also sweet, beautiful. He commands that a life-giving apple be brought from a western garden. He brings health to a mother. He pairs off male and female characters. He encourages the gift of laughter. All these things, as we know from elsewhere in Lewis's writings, we should understand as the influences of Venus. Because Aslan is the true Venus. He is the morning star, as the book of Revelation tells us. I am the bright and morning star, Christ says. Lewis takes all his knowledge of medieval cosmology and turns it to Christian effect including in the virtues that the children begin to display. The moral climax of the magician's nephew comes when Diggory is tempted to steal the apple and to use it for an admittedly good effect, the healing of his mother, but a less good end than the one he's promised Aslan to put it to, that is, for the planting of a tree of protection that will guard Narnia from the evil that he, Diggory, has brought there on the day of its birth. So you remember how, on the journey to the Western Garden, Diggory and Polly and the horse Fledge stop and rest, and then we read, as the bright young stars of that new world came out, they talked over everything, how Diggory had hoped to get something for his mother, and how instead of that he'd been sent on this message. The young stars and the young heir of Narnia will shed their influence into Diggory's heart. In other words, they will shed the Holy Spirit of Aslan into Diggory's heart, because Aslan is the morning star. So that when Diggory is tempted by the witch the next day, he will make the right decision and not steal the apple, but rather bring it back to Aslan as he's promised. Diggory's loves will consequently become rightly ordered. He will learn to love Aslan even more than he loves his mother. By Venus, he will become virtuous. That is to say, by Aslan, portrayed by means of Venus imagery, he will become virtuous. In Prince Caspian, we see a similar efficacy in the Narnian air. We're told in this story that Caspian sleeps under the stars and that he begins, as a result, to harden. Now, of course, he begins to harden because the stars are shedding their influence upon him and Prince Caspian is written to embody and express the hard virtue of Mars. Martial imagery provides Lewis with his imaginative blueprint here. Aslan in this book is the true Mars, the true Lord of Hosts, mighty in battle. The boys in this story learn to be good soldiers of Christ Jesus. They put on the whole armor of God. They fight the good fight. They give Aslan the salute. They fight the hag and the werewolf. Peter fights the single combat with Miraz. They become truly martial as they breathe in the air of that world, the spirit of that world, in relationship with Aslan. Likewise, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the whole story is designed to express the jovial personality, the influences of Jove, Jupiter, but again turned to Christian effect. To quote Lewis's poem, The Planets, 
Jupiter brings about winter past and guilt forgiven. When the white witch's winter passes and spring comes, and the spring air floods into the witch's castle, we see this jovial influenza having its effect. Lewis is portraying the life of the Christian by means of jovial imagery because Jupiter is the king. That's Jupiter's prime quality. And the children become kings and queens in a grand coronation scene at the end of the tale. Just and gentle are Jove's children, Lewis writes in his Planets poem, and therefore Susan becomes Queen Susan the Gentle. Edmund becomes King Edmund the Just. Aslan crowns them and the others. He enables them to participate in his own kingly nature. By Jove, they're being kingly. Interestingly, the petrified giant, Rumblebuffin, is released from his stony state when Aslan breathes on his feet. Susan asks, is it safe? It's all right, shouted Aslan joyously. Once the feet are put right, all the rest of him will follow. As Lewis wrote to Edward Lofstrom, you are in the right way. Walk, don't keep on looking at it. Virtue comes through breathing in and then exercising, through doing, not so much through thinking, still less through thinking about doing. Now the children in each story don't know with their contemplative consciousness that they're breathing in the spirit of Jove or the spirit of Mars or the spirit of the morning star. However, they do know it with their enjoyment consciousness. They do know that they're becoming royal. They do know that they're becoming knights. What Lewis gives us here is a brilliant portrayal of the virtuous life of the Christian, in which the characters become good by living in Christ's spirit, but don't reflect upon it. He sums this up particularly well in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe when we see how Edmund has changed after his conversation with Aslan. You have a traitor there, says the witch. Of course, everyone present knew that she meant Edmund. But Edmund had got past thinking about himself after all he'd been through and after the talk he'd had that morning. He just went on looking at Aslan. Edmund shows real growth in virtue in that he had got past thinking about himself. He simply looks at the kingly lion from whom he's received forgiveness and he looks along the spirit of that same lion. The degree to which Lewis is uninterested in moral reflection in the Christian life is shown in the fact that he doesn't even admit us to the conversation between Aslan and Edmund. We're just shown them in the distance, pacing to and fro on the dewy grass early in the morning. And there, he says, there is no need to tell you, and no one ever heard what Aslan was saying, but it was a conversation that Edmund never forgot. Lewis very subtly communicates here the personal knowing, the enjoyment consciousness that should exist between each Christian and God. We don't always need to be talking about it or reflecting upon it. We need to keep looking at the divine source from where our goodness comes, and we look at the source by looking along the spirit. One's mind runs up the sunbeam to the sun as Lewis puts it in letters to Malcolm. It is by the sun that we see the sun. It is by the spirit that we cry, Abba, Father. It is as Lucy looks along the beam that she sees Aslan flying as an albatross. Lewis uses that very phrase, looking along the beam from meditation in a tool shed, as he depicts Lucy's vision of Aslan during the Dark Island episode in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And he does so because the Dawn Treader story is irradiated with solar influences. 
Aslan in that book is depicted by means of sun imagery, scattering light from his mane, showing himself to be more precious than gold in that episode on Goldwater Island when he's shown shining as if in bright sunlight, though the sun had in fact gone in. He is the light of the world, to use scriptural imagery. And the children, when they taste the sweet sea at the eastern end of the world, learn what it is like to drink light. They swallow up the sun's influence, almost literally. They become one with the Christ of their world. Lewis, though his theology is always fully scriptural, goes a long way round through classical mythology and medieval cosmology, enriching his theology as he goes in order to come back to a scriptural conclusion, having plundered the spoils of the Egyptians. So, in conclusion, what have we seen in this examination? We've seen that screw tape rather likes exacerbating our consciousness of our own virtue. By Jove, I'm being humble. As MacDonald says in a passage Lewis quotes, the foolish man rejoices in his own consciousness instead of the life of that consciousness. We've seen that nonetheless, Lewis thinks there is a place for consciously talking about and looking at virtue but that this is a secondary place, a place of lesser importance in comparison to actually living the good life. The healthier we are, the less we will think about diet and medicine and hospital visits. We'll just get on and live the good life. In the meantime, we have to do quite a bit of moral reflection. As again, Lewis writes to Edward Lofstrom, I think your comparison between the self and the telescope is singularly accurate. The instrument vanishes from consciousness just in so far as it is perfected. But until it is perfected, we must attend to it. Otherwise, we shall be like the man who mistakes a smudge on the glass for a gigantic animal on the moon. And the moon takes us to the planets and their influences. We've seen how in Narnia, by means of planetary imagery, Christianized cosmology, Lewis depicts different aspects of the good life and shows how the children take on Aslan's qualities, how they become virtuous, without contemplating what they're doing, but just enjoying it. Coming to know God for Lewis was not like learning a subject, but like breathing a new atmosphere, as he says in Reflections on the Psalms. Coming to know God is not so much like learning a subject as it is like breathing a new atmosphere. Aslan's spirit so floods the Narnian atmosphere that the children breathe him in naturally. They look at Aslan by looking along his spirit. Once their feet are put right, the rest will follow soon enough. And one final point. I mentioned the words influence and air and the importance of understanding their connotations. We ought also to pay attention to one other word, consideration. I called this address Ethical Considerations in Narnia for a reason. Consider, formed from two Latin words, con meaning with, and sidus meaning star, as in sidereal. To consider something is literally to think with the stars, and was originally a term in astrology or augury. Since the heavens are telling the glory of God in the words of Psalm 19, it makes good sense to think with the stars. They may lead us to Christ, as they led the wise men to Christ in Matthew's Gospel. 
The best kind of ethical considerations are those that are open to the influences of the Holy Spirit. And you will find that Lewis plays with the etymology of consider in several places in his writings. In the discarded image, for instance, and also in that hideous strength. Perhaps most skillfully, he does so in the first of the Narnia Chronicles. The lion, the witch, and the wardrobe shows us how to live the good life by Jove, to be filled all through with virtue of Jupiter, the king. And near the start of the book, you will remember, Peter and Susan, perplexed by the differing accounts that they've received from Edmund and Lucy about what the wardrobe contains, take their problem to the professor. How do you know, the professor asks, that your sister's story is not true? Oh, but, began Susan, and then stopped. Anyone could see from the old man's face that he was perfectly serious. Then Susan pulled herself together and said, but Edmund said they'd only been pretending. That is a point, said the professor, which certainly deserves consideration. Very careful consideration. Let the reader understand. Thank you.